Good evening. Hello. Thank you for coming tonight. It's a great crowd. I'm Tim Greenlee, one of the assistant associate deans in the business school. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our executive speaker series and thank you sincerely for coming. This is an outstanding crowd and let me welcome our speaker tonight, Bo Cummins, and just say a little bit about him. As you know, he is the co-chief operating officer for SunTrust Banks and uh, I have to say he's the first speaker that I know of who has come with uh, a posse, uh, a group who's going to heckle him. He brings his own heckler so security. we welcome his team here as well. He also calls him his security guard so if we get rowdy they might uh, take care of any business with him. Those would be the people seated on the front row uh, that we reserve for them. But just to tell you a little bit about Bo, we've had the opportunity to meet him today um, I think the most important thing that I should say about him, I want to say first, he used to figuratively sit where you sit right now. And I think that's the most important thing we should always remember about people who join us for the executive speaker series. Most, if not all, were you once before. And that's one thing I want you to remember as he delivers his message and he engages with you. Think about the fact that he was you and now he is who he is and ask him about his journey as he shares his journey. As you can see, some uh, fast facts there about him. Started his career at Ford, ask him maybe about how he got that job um, as he moved on through the banking field at Citibank and, and Bank of America and then joined SunTrust um, and the various roles he's held there and currently serving as the co-COO. Um, a, a couple of things that maybe aren't there um, that I find interesting. Um, I'm sort of mixed up in my head about what I always wanted to do, and he has lots of passions as well, so that made me feel good. Um, I'm a frustrated architect. He's uh, maybe a frustrated painter. Uh, he said his uh, favorite medium is acrylics. I'm a skier, he's a snowboarder, uh, and he, he married the two and actually showed me a picture of a, a painting he did of a snowboarder. So maybe he, if we're good, he'll show his, his artwork as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bo. He's gonna say a little bit about his company. Uh, so join me in welcoming him, and then when he's uh, told a little bit about himself and his background, I'll come back and we'll have sort of a, a Q&A and discuss a few topics today about uh, global business, about uh, SunTrust, and then his advice for you. So Bo, thank you so much for being here. Greetings, Farmer School. As my three sons greet me, I will greet you. Sup? That's how we do it at home. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I've, I'll be happy to tell you about my little journey uh, from Miami University all the way to Atlanta through a circuitous route through Wall Street and, uh, and the car industry, which you know, is sort of a non sequitur by definition. It's been a very interesting journey, but before I get into that, what I really want to do is set the stage and tell you a little bit about SunTrust Bank and you know, give you, kind of frame the issue for you about what I'm presently doing and why you should care. So let's start with SunTrust. The first thing I want you to know is, and I had a client tell me this at breakfast on Tuesday, a uh, guy who runs a health, CEO of a, and founder of a healthcare company uh, that's actually based in Cincinnati, uh, the CEO said to me, your bank is the only purpose-driven bank I've ever heard of. You just think about that, I think that's highly distinctive. And I want to just comment on that for a second. We have a mission as a bank that is to light the way to financial well-being. That's the phraseology we use. What we mean by that is we want to help drive financial education in America and to, by doing so, helping people reach financial confidence. Financial stress is one of the key forms of stress on Americans today, and having financial acumen is an experience and knowledge is, is the mitigant. So we are a force behind that. We do that for, our, for consumers that bank with us, but we also do it for folks that don't bank with us. We're happy to do it that way. We call it our on-up movement. And we do it for the employees of the companies that we bank. So we come at this through multiple lenses. It's important to us. It's core to who we are. Now, the bank itself, you might think of us as a regional bank. And I think if you did, you would join many others. But I would submit to you that that definition is obsolete. The bank itself is organized between consumer banking, 
and wholesale banking. And as the map shows, much of it is in the dark orange, is what is our, our uh, historical brick and mortar branch footprint. So we're from Maryland on down to Florida and over uh, into Tennessee. That's great, except that's not the only way to interact with our bank. You can interact with us on your app. You can interact with us through Lightstream, um, a San Diego-based company we own. You can interact through us, with us through our investment bank, our corporate bank, uh, our commercial bank. And these banking arms are national. In the wholesale, which is my day job, running all our teams that, uh, that help our companies that we bank grow, we have offices in Boston, in New York, in Chicago, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, uh, in Dallas, in Houston, in Atlanta, not the least of it, in Charlotte. So it's, clear, it's, it's completely a national footprint, a national enterprise. And so SunTrust is changing. It's growing. And in doing so, it's a, it's a $200 billion asset bank. And we've got good momentum. So that's the story here. And uh, let me just take you to the next page, which is, in case you uh, like reading annual reports for a living, I've taken the liberty to take the highlights from the last several. And things are going great. And we're going great because we run a good bank. We take care of our clients. And part of our purpose is we have something we call our flag. It's our tenants. It's our value statement. And on it is, at the top, is client first. So maybe, Tim, we can talk about that later. But we put our client first. Everything we do puts the client's interests first, their needs first. Everything follows. So when you do that, you end up with uh, growth in earnings per share. You also, if you run a good company, you can produce revenue uh, that increasingly more efficient cost, which is the middle graph, the yellow. In our industry, we call that the efficiency ratio. It's a key metric for banks. And then our capital position is strong and allows us to support our shareholders, another major constituent, because we work for those guys. So it's kind of non-trivial. Now, I mentioned the wholesale banking part of SunTrust. Let me just frame it for you. Out of a $9 billion bank, we're $4 billion in revenue. So call it 45% of the bank's top line, but we're 65% of the bank's bottom line. So we're a non-trivial contributor to, the, to SunTrust's success. And then you say, well, you know, I would, I would also submit to you that we were probably a third of the bank instead of two-thirds of the bank's net income 10 years ago. So things have been changing, and this picture tells the story of why. Now, if you want to go to compete with other financial services companies, you better know why you're better. You have to be able to articulate a comparative advantage to channel on channel Porter, uh, or a competitive advantage if you want to say it a different way. And this is ours. We've seen the world sort of bifurcate, and we're shooting right down the center. The world in wholesale banking is really bifurcated between those with full investment banking capabilities, uh, they referred to in the, in, the, in the jargon as bulge bracket firms, um, or universal bank firms, which are sort of like the Bank of America, uh, JP Morgan, Citibank, and those kind of guys. And then there's the bulge bracket, which is the traditional Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, used to include some names that aren't existent anymore. And they occupy a universe that covers publicly held companies and private equity run companies. That's that space. Then there's this other part of the world so, uh, that we call the middle market boutiques and regional banks. They're different because the regional banks do not have traditionally, and I say traditionally, all of the capabilities that you find in an investment bank. They have some of them in many cases, none of them in lots of cases. But what if they had all of them. That would be interesting. So to the right on that graph, you see lots of names. Many are familiar to you. Uh, but to, to play in a boutique is to have some of, the, some of the critical inputs, but not all. And to play as a bulge bank or, or a universal bank is to have all of them. The problem is, when you're one of these really big banks, you focus up market, because you go for the really big uh, situations. A $49 billion telecom deal being financed uh, is something if you're in the telecom sector you cannot miss or you will have a bad day. 
$49 billion is a lot of money. If you're down in the middle market and you're doing $100 million deals, it takes a lot of $100 million deals to make up one miss at $49 billion. So the big companies focus on big things. The middle market, though, is dominated, which I'm going to define as $2 billion in revenue and below companies. So they're, they're big companies, but they're not, you know, they're not intergalactic companies. And there are a lot of companies, regional banks love that space, they focus there, but they have limited toolkits in many cases and tend to think of this solution set as lending money, making payments, um, that sort of thing, taking deposits. Then there are these boutiques that pop up and there's some of the more uh, esoteric names you see on there like a Harris Williams or what have you, uh, Green Hill. These are folks that come with intellectual capital and want to be at the table, solve big problems, but they have got no balance sheet. So in some ways they're like consultants. They can tell you the right answer, but they cannot affect the right answer in all cases and certainly not the whole equation. We stand in between. We stand right in the middle. We have, through our investment bank, SunTrust, Robinson Humphrey, which we spent the better part of 20 years building out. Um, we have the full capabilities of the folks on the left, and we compete with them every day. We've taken our SunTrust, Robinson Humphrey business. I wish I had a little graph of the, the funny, fun bar charts. But if we did, you'd see we took, in the last 10 years, a $500 million business and turned it into $2 billion. And we did it in the last 10 years when the world had blown up and the pie was actually shrinking. So that means we took a lot of market share and we did so by beating the people on the left. So that's, what we, that's with whom we compete every day, but ironically we compete in the space the folks on the right think they own. So we're right where we want to be. It's a very differentiated place. And in colloquial terms what it means is we show up, we're nice people, we're smart people, we play team ball and we put the client first, and then we bring firepower to be able to do everything that client needs done and do it for their shareholders and help them achieve their growth. So that's what we're doing. It's fun. We like it because winning is fun. Uh, so here's another way to look at the differentiation. You see on the left, full product capabilities, industry vertical expertise, middle market focus, one team approach, which is about culture, and then the balance sheet. You got to, you know, a big balance sheet allows you to do important big things for clients. So let's line them up. They're the universal banks. Yeah, they got all the products. Absolutely. They're, they have industry expertise in a lot of it. Um, and they have a big, big balance sheet. Some of them have trillion dollar balance sheets. Really big. But what about this idea of being focused on the middle market? Uh, not so much. I've lived in those places. I've worked for two of those companies. When uh, somebody in Cincinnati in the commercial banking business calls across to the capital markets desk in New York, uh, where I used to sit, I can tell you what happens. They, they take the phone call, they go, who are you, what? In a company with 200,000 employees, and they hang up the phone. And they do it without any uh, ramifications. Why? Because that little thing, on, that little opportunity on the phone the time they allocated that, they might miss the big $49 billion deal and they can't afford to change their line of sight. So that's the behavior that you see in the very big banks. Uh, they're not middle market focused as a result. Um, and I would say that they weren't acting like they're on the same team because who hangs up on their teammate? So that's why we give them an X for one team approach. Then you've got the boutique firms who are uh, very one team oriented. They are very focused on the middle market. And in fact, they're very expert in the industries that they cover. So they have a lot of game with one little problem. They don't have all the products and they don't have the balance sheet. So it's a little like having a consultant show up and tell you what to do, but they can't do it for you. They can't help you do it. And then in the middle are the regional banks, traditionally, where they've got, uh, they love the middle market. That's why they exist. They love one team approach. They're nice places to work and collegial. Um, they play team ball and you'd probably like to work there, and the balance sheet, they've got a pretty good sized balance sheet. They just have a little problem, which is they don't have all the capabilities. They don't have M&A departments. They don't have private equity sponsor coverage teams. They don't have leverage finance capabilities and high yield, uh, et cetera. Those things in the middle market are really important for helping companies grow through acquisition and what have you. And um, a lot of times they get frustrated in the clients do because we send bankers in as regional banks and we have and the client has to teach them about their industry and their company. Well that's frustrating. Why should you have to teach a bunch of bankers 
about what you do, I thought they were supposed to be expert. So on the right is us, where we actually have all the capabilities, we actually have the industry expertise, and we're organized that way. Uh, we are focused on the middle market, that's why we exist, uh, and it's the only place we focus. We are big on how we behave together, and we want it to be a place we like working. Uh, that's my job. I'm in charge of the culture and the strategy. And then I, the way I look at it is I create the conditions for success and get out of the way and let the team rock and roll, and they're great. And then the last thing is balance sheet. $200 billion balance sheet, you can get a lot of things done. So that's why we are achieving national recognition. It's kind of fun. Uh, we've gotten some really great awards you see on the right there, and not the least of one is the International Financing Review's Middle Market Equity House um, of the Year for 2016. And by the way, equity and MA is the hardest game to break into and be recognized in, uh, and we're doing it. So really fun. We weren't doing any of this stuff even 15 years ago, so uh, we were really excited about the journey. And by the way, you know, it, it pays to be a winner, so that's fun too. So. To what end? Well, here's where we're going. Our vision is, and I'm going to work it backwards, okay? I'm going to take the sentence and deconstruct it backwards. Uh, starts with how we behave. So we want, our team behaves with authenticity. It means we're real people. We act like real people. We're not posers, and we're not trying to, you know, to uh, become sort of big-time people. Um, I've lived in those places. They're amusing, and then they're not. Uh, the second thing, agility. We have to be fast faster, more agile than these giant companies that have the giant firepower, and we can do that. And actually, uh, the agility is the hallmark of our scale. So what looks like a $200 billion bank competing with a, a trillion dollar bank, you might think we ought to, we, we ought to have a, um, uh, a challenge in our hands. We might have to be compromised. Well, I would submit, you flip it around and go, hey, 200 billion moves fast, you know, and we can, we can get the right people together with the right preparation in front of our clients in 24 hours. That's not what our competitors do. So agility matters. One team is, we all have, we're, we're all on the same team. It doesn't matter which part of the bank calls which part of the bank. Everybody rallies and we play ball and we help each other. Highly differentiated. I've got my colleagues here, which I appreciate you guys coming here. Don't throw anything at me. Uh, they, these guys, two of them are Miami grads and um, and we got the market president for Cleveland here. Jim Guyther, raise your hand, please. Ben Willingham, market president for Cincinnati. And Mike Lincoln, who's our division president over in, in the, for the Midwest in corporate banking. Okay, so these guys, um, they can make a phone call and get anybody in the bank to mobilize and be on the ground and, and help a client solve a problem or capitalize on an opportunity fast. That's, just, that's what I mean by one team. Um, and our objective is to, to help our clients see the future and get and, and push them there. Help them mobilize. I ask clients, what are you going to look like in six years? After I understand their business and I understand who they serve, what solutions and products they use, um, where they go to market, once I understand all that and I understand where the operating leverage is and what their comparative advantage is, there's lots to learn and be curious about. It's really fun seeing them, all these companies and seeing how they do it. Um, once I understand that, I say, great. Beautiful company, love it. What's it going to look like six years from now? Which is, in a way, you know, Tim said, I, I paint, so let's use the art thing. These CEOs of these companies are artists. They are creating things that didn't exist before. And it's really fun to help them do that. And when you know what they're trying to create, you can help them create it. And I assure you, they're very loyal to those who help create it. And that's our distinguishing characteristic. And as we achieve that success, a couple things happen. The bar charts go from the uh, lower left that you saw to the upper right. That was exciting. And um, they, they refer us to other people they know. CEOs hang out with CEOs. We get referrals. We get new prospects. We get new clients. And we get uh, recognized. And it's increasingly, it's national. We get, we get clients that, rec uh, that are referring us everywhere. All right? And to that end, I was in San Francisco um, for two days last week on Thursday and Friday. Had dinner with the CEOs from 11 different uh, financial technology startup companies, and uh, and it's just interesting because our bankers out there are, fin are, are fintech um, experts, and they can immediately bring 11 CEOs together for a nice dinner, and we had a chat about the future of technology and 
the convergence with that and banking. So pretty interesting conversation. So with that, Tim, let's light this candle. Everything working? God, there we go. He said I had to hold it really close, so this is really close. I'm so glad we got the chairs. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to stay in his chair, though. I noticed it's this unclear. afternoon. Can yeah. you guys hear me? Yep. Good. All right. So I've got just a few questions. I've broken them down into three groups. More, start more with a global, big picture look, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, SunTrust more in detail. And then he has some advice that he wants to give to students who might be interested in finance, but might be more specifically in banking. But, but I thought maybe what we would start with first is maybe I, I've noticed when I listen to financial news, a lot of the big players that you mentioned um, and often have advice uh, or an outlook on where the economy is going and maybe what's SunTrust's perspective on that? Okay, so one learns as they go through their life and they draw on experiences. So I'm going to tell you what my outlook is. I think it's 1988 right now. You go, huh, what do I do with that? The answer is the baby boom were a generation that preceded you, of which I'm a proud member. And in 1982 and 83, we had a big re very difficult recession. It was short, but tough. And it was really hard to get a job out of this place. Companies weren't showing up, and we were all scrambling. And I was a sophomore and a junior, and I'm watching the seniors struggle. So I got my act together trying to figure out, this isn't so easy. I need to get tight. I need to have a plan. And I got organized. But what I saw happen after that was the economy picked up. Uh, why? Because interest rates were cut, regulations were cut, taxes were cut, and a in a boom of young people came into the marketplace, had household formation, bought homes, and had careers launched. And that group created a market phenomenon known as a, a, a stock market boom that went on from 84 to 1999 when the tech world blew up. All right, so a 15-year virtuous run. I look at you guys and go, hey, you're, just, you're the same. There's more of you. There are more of you. Then there were the baby boomers. And you go, all right, so that's pretty interesting. As you all enter, and the, those ahead of you are in the workforce today, many working for us. Um, and the Miami guys are doing a great job, the kids, very nice. Um, we have a number of, you, of your peers that are in our company. What, what we, I think I'm seeing, Tim, is this a virtuous 15-year run that looks a lot like, and we're in the first five years of the 15-year run, and it looks a lot like the 80s and 90s, and uh, that doesn't mean there won't be crashes. There were. There was an 87 crash. Uh, there was a 1989 Resolution Trust. There was an 87 Russia thing. There, uh, we, had, we had a number of big pullbacks, but the secular trend was demographically driven, and it repeats itself today. I'm curious how much you think the students should be paying attention to the world's central banks of various countries, whether it's the Fed or the European Central Bank or Bank of Japan. Bank of England, should they pay attention to this? Do you pay attention to it? Does your team pay attention to it? What advice do you have? Or yeah. what other economic indicators should they be paying attention to? And, yeah, and why? It's a great question. So the short answer is I'd pay attention to it. I pay attention to it personally. Uh, but it's kind of esoteric stuff. It's, you know, it's, you're, you're standing here on the ground and we're talking 50,000 foot stuff. But I would submit to you that um, I pay attention to it for the following reason. There is a war for jobs going on on the globe today. And the war is being waged in the currency market. And the currency market is being, is currency's trade is a function of interest rate differentials. And so interest rates are being manipulated by central banks to create advantage so that exports are, their exports could be advantaged over our exports so they get the jobs of creating manufacturing the stuff that other people buy. That's what's happening out there. That's the big game. Um, I would suggest that understanding what central banks are doing, um, everything from zero interest rate policy, ZERP, to quantitative easing, to this theory of uh, currency debasement, non-trivial issues that affect your life right now. Uh, it'll show up in inflation down the road, and those with balance, assets on a balance sheet will inflate right along and be happy. Those who do not have assets and are, and are just taking their wages and, make, and using them to pay for goods and services are going to find that the goods and services get more expensive at a rate that exceeds their wages, and they will, in real terms, feel less prosperous. So there's a lot going on. You can't fight that wave, but you can surf that wave. You might want to learn about it. 
Thank you for that. The related um, many economic, um, those who study and predict, saw 2018 as a year of um, uh, a lot of um, elections around the world would go a long way in predicting what was going to happen in the near future. If you look, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil will all elect presidents this year. Uh, midterm elections in the U.S., at China, what they recently did, uh, extending their president, and Russia uh, in, in their uh, anointing of a president. Um, sorry for that, might have been the wrong anointing. way to phrase that. I like that. Um, I'll strike I like that, that slide. record. Uh, but uh, I, I wonder what advice do you have to our students as they um, think about these events? Should they pay attention to that? Not just what central banks are doing, but what's happening in the, in the political world as well. Well, at the end of this, we're going to talk about how do you get a job. Right, and so one of the things I would say to answer to Tim's question is, it pays to be intellectually curious and to see the big picture. Um, that, to, to a prospective employer, looks like intelligence on display, and we like to hire smart people. So paying attention to what's happening globally is just smart, and then trying to learn, I mean, there's two ways you can learn. You can learn from the mistakes of others and the, the great um, decisions of others, or you can just stumble around and learn th from the school of hard knocks. I submit the former is advantageous and costs less in terms of tuition. I'm going to switch this question from you and switch it out to the audience. Maybe we can do a quick poll. How many of you use Venmo? Okay. Uh, all right. Second question. Can you find me on it and send me a few bucks? That'd be nice. <laughs> Oh, all right. We yeah, can make this a for-profit exactly. talk. That's right. Do I get a Five cut? bucks from everybody. <laughs> see you uptown. That sounds good. Yeah. Just tell them where to go, right? <laughs> so my question of asking, I, I, I assumed I knew the answer was going to be positive from you on Venmo. Um, what do you see as the, I don't know, the challenges or the disruptions in the financial services industry? And given that this group uses Venmo quite heavily, yeah. um, how has Zelle tried to counter that and have they done it? And what do you see coming in that area? Yeah, so it's a, it, the innovation going on in financial services, especially through the fintech, uh, in the fintech side of the world, is fantastic and it's really exciting. Um, if you think about it, I had a, uh, a guy who was is CEO of a startup company and actually did another company called S1, which got sold. And so this guy's in his second or third lap of starting companies, selling companies. And um, I, I tend to meet with startups and incubators, and we'll make equity investments in them, and we'll hire them as, as if they bolt onto our, our financial services offering and help us um, get better. And so I'm kind of interested in this. And this one guy was saying, look, bro, do you know what a payment is? And I said, yeah, we're moving money from point A to point B. He goes, it's very simple. It's a debit and a credit. That's all a payment is. He said, so in the future world, they will happen simultaneously because that's how they actually happen in real accounting land. You do them at the same time. Therefore, this idea that when you move money from one, I move money from me to you, that it should take any more time than the speed of light is, is uh, is outdated, and that it should cost much is outdated. So all everything's re converging to real-time payments, and there are a number of different, in the vernacular is rails. How do you do it? So uh, Venmo does it through the debit rails. There are other rails, such as ACH uh, and wire, and they all have different constraints and benefits. So what, I think what you're going to see, though, is Technology converging to make it the best client experience is right now and cheap. And we all have to be on board with that because that's good for our clients and it's fantastic. And right now, I'm, my phone's lighting up. Thank, thank you all for the five bucks. I think I'm good to go here. I'm up like a hundred grand right now. <laughs> the last question in the big section, just if we moved away maybe from Venmo and back to investment banking, how do you see the, the broader investment banking area evolving? Well, I, you know, the tech, I'm going to take a, a, uh, the fintech this conversation and converge it with the investment banking question, which is disruption is the way of the future. Um, the word change, I don't even think captures anything anymore. You know, there's somebody said change is a constant. I agree with that. So really change is a constant state of evolution. It's a constant state of getting better. And those who don't want to play that game need to get off the playing field because that's where we live. So in investment banking, 
in, when I showed you the, the, the circles and where we are in the center, I actually think we're, we are a disruptive force in, in the investment banking landscape. I, now, it would be immodest of me to sit here and say that to you, which it is, and I'm happy to be immodest. But the other thing is, I have, um, I have external third party evidence of that. We have the equity analyst who covers banks at JP Morgan, um, Janaya, Jana, uh, come and speak to our board. And he said to the board, you have to know that every consulting company in America has a presentation on SunTrust, Robinson, Humphrey, and they're shopping it to every uh, bank, regional bank in the country, because that is your killer app, and everybody else has to have it, and that is the most disruptive thing happening in wholesale banking today. So it's a great compliment to us and the thousands of us who are doing this together, but it's, it's, it's actually legit and, and kind of fun to get the accolade. Thank you for the big picture questions. I'm going to shift to SunCorp, sorry, SunTrust a little bit uh, and move into how do you segment your uh, customer markets and um, where do you see the opportunities? Well, segmentation is inherently an exercise in lumping clients with the similar need profiles together and making sure that you deliver to them what they need. So um, I'll give you a, a broad brush stroke. Um, there is a age old uh, zeitgeist in the, in the banking world that says commercial banking clients, and I'm going to tell you what that means. It, it means clients that are usually family owned businesses, privately held, closely held businesses. They, they don't pay enough to banks to warrant the expensive advice laden industry expert model that you see up in corporate banking land and investment banking land. Therefore, um, you can't deliver that, that expertise down to the private companies and, and make it economic for your shareholder. Ergo, don't do it. Um, that has been going on for a long time. That's why the boutiques we talked about popped up. Uh, that's why companies like General, uh, GE Capital, now gone, but that's why it popped up. Heller Financial, now gone, but that's why it popped up, to fill the void. Um, and I'll give you some numbers. The average investment banking client at our company will pay us in fees and interest income, but will pay us in revenue, knowingly pay us, happy to pay us, um, seven figures a year per corporate banking client or investment bank client, okay? Um, the average commercial banking client, so I'm gonna say that might be a, that might be a company up there in, in the high end, I'm talking about that might be a billion dollars in revenue. The average commercial banking client who may be $70 million in revenue will pay us on average $75,000. Okay, so if I bring a bunch of expensive people in to solve complex problems and, get paid, and it costs me $200,000 to deliver that solution and I get paid 75, dollars uh, that's, that's not good business. But the question you had, I had to ask myself is, is the $75,000 a given? Is it the chicken or the egg, in other words? Is it 75 grand because nobody's adding any value and, they not, and therefore that's all they deserve? Or is it 75 grand because that's all they can afford and everybody's tried and, and, it's a, and don't, don't be silly, it can't work. So we decided to test the theory and that's what these guys are doing here is we said, no, nah, we think if we actually hire expert bankers and, and put an arsenal of product experts behind them and make them into the conductors of the virtuoso product symphony, that if they will be, because of their expertise, be able to see where the client's trying to go, they will in, pivot internally and determine what can we do to help that client achieve that and affect that. And in doing so, we can actually help create value for the client. We help create value. So we can take an enterprise that might have an economic value, an enterprise value of $25 million, and if we help them grow, we could turn it into $60 million. I would submit to you that if you, we could help a family grow their business by $35 million of value that they could sell, they wouldn't have any problem paying take 75 grand up to 175 grand or 275 grand. They'd be happy, that's a pretty good trade. In other words, would you ever, if I could deliver $30 million of value to you and you had to pay me 200 grand, would you do it? I think the answer is yes. Um, so that's our journey and it turns out, what's interesting is we have three kinds of expertise. Industry expertise, well, so maybe four. Relationship expertise. Who lives in that town with those people 
and knows them well, A. B, industry expertise. Do you really understand the logistics business for food service, for example, uh, or the healthcare billing practice or healthcare staffing industry? Do you understand that? Um, if you do, then the client wants to talk to you. Uh, third, C, the expertise on, on structuring. They, company A wants to buy company B. How can they do that? How do you do it? Um, how do you finance it? What's the capital structure need to look like? There are ways capital structures can be formed that blow companies up. There are ways that empower them to go reload and do it again. Um, smart growth is doing it right. So we, if we get structuring expertise on the ground, that's helpful. And then the, and the, the last one is product expertise, which the structure basically says, I need two units of that, four of those, and let's bring it together, and the banker is the, is the driver. Of it. So four forms of expertise converging on a client. Now what happens to our 75,000 bucks? Well, it turns out we know the answer now. And the answer is, it goes up. When we introduce the corporate finance structuring, um, or sorry, the, the, the industry experts to the client, and we add value, that client pays us on average, and we want to guess, 75 grand is the base, we get paid for adding value. They actually, actually pay us on average $400,000 now. So a 10% increase would be 7,500 bucks more. That's a, that is a multiplier. That's huge operating leverage, and, and we find that they're willing to do it because they've never seen it before. They tell us, Tim, they say, I've never, I've never had a conversation with a banker like this before. And I say, well, what? And I'm, I sit in front of these clients. I say, what are your bankers? And I'll ask them all these questions. Go, never, nobody asks me questions like that about my business. So what do they ask you? They say, they ask me if I want a loan. And you go, well, that's the dumbest question in the world. I mean, that's like the, working at the drive through window asking if you want to supersize it. There's not a lot of intellectual capital being exchanged here. So our model is, no, let's figure out how to drive value for the client, and they will gladly pay our shareholders. And if the shareholders get value, they will gladly pay our teammates. Everybody wins, and it's geared to the client's favor. So I love that. So it turns 75 grand turns into 400, and when we put the corporate finance structure on top because we're helping on an M&A transaction or inorganic growth strategy, it goes up to 600 and some thousand dollars. So that's like nine times uh, multiplier from the, from the old assumption that no, there's no way that you can make any money bringing really smart, experienced bankers into the middle market. Uh, we've, we've blown up that myth. It turns out the clients will pay for value. If you add value, they're happy to pay, and that's what we're doing. Your comments there in an earlier slide, too, had the phrase um, on up. Banking. On up. Can you uh, maybe share with us where that originated yeah. and, and, and what does it mean? Well, this is a tip of the hat to the marketing professionals. And um, our chief marketing officer, Susan Somersill Johnson, uh, came up with the idea. She said um, it was important to her that we pursue this idea of driving financial confidence into our, our client base and helping people understand this complex world of financial services and that they could navigate their lives with less stress and have a, a, a better life if, we, if they had that understanding. And I promise you, and some of you grew up in households where you know, everything's a crisis when you're spending a little bit of money because money's tight, that's what it feels like. I used to, back in the day before cell phones, we'd be on the phone. I don't know if you ever had the experience. My dad would yell, that's long distance, hang up. And I'm like, you know, what's going on here? Why don't you just go make some more money? We don't have to worry about this. But it turns out that, uh, that financial stress is real. So, our, so on up is a movement we started to, to help the education process through eight modules for anybody. You can do it. You can go to onup.com, and I ask you to consider doing that. And you can, you can walk through this and you go, yeah, I got this, I'm a finance major, I got this, I don't need to go on your silly website. I promise you there's stuff in there you have never thought about. So yeah, there's a check, balance check account's great. That's academic. But what if you get to the part about, um, uh, about insurance? What do you know about insurance needs? What do you know about wills? What do you know about estate planning? It takes you all the way through how to bulletproof yourself, future-proof yourself personally against all the potholes in the life ahead and the unknowns. So I check it out. It's free. We don't try to make a penny off it. We just do it because we think, as a corporate citizen, that's who, if we're not going to do it, who's going to do it? Now, it's fun, if I may 
is we because we've done the research. The research says 53% of Americans do not have, ready for this, 2,000 bucks in, saved up in case they hit a pothole. They have an emergency. I can tell you, if your air conditioner blows out, it's going to cost you more than 2,000 bucks. Um, there's a lot of ways to make $2,000 disappear that you didn't plan for. And more than half Americans don't have two grand. So they're just sitting there waiting to get have massive wave of stress blow them out of the water. And we're like, we can help these people. So that's what the plan was. But it came from this, which is, holy cow. So, so, I, so we launched this thing. And then we said, well, we got 25,000 teammates at SunTrust. And we're asking them to help our customers become um, financially confident. But before we can ask our own teammates to do that, shouldn't we know whether they're in a stable, strong position and are, in fact, themselves financially confident because if they're not, how in the heck are they going to help somebody else? So we, um, we made a program available to our clients. I'm oh, sorry, to our teammates. And it went like this. Hey, if you guys sign up and you complete the eight modules, uh, we'll, we'll make a deal with you. We'll put, and this is 25,000 people, we'll put $1,000 in. You open an account, we'll put a grand in. You put a grand in, you have your two grand. And we'll put a floor under everybody um, if, if you need that. So we make it available. Right now, we had uh, 20,000 of them sign up and 16,000 of them complete the program or so. And we've spent over $10 million supporting our teammates to get them in a position to support our clients. So that's pretty cool. But it gets even cooler, which is um, that's all the consumer stuff. But you know, we cover companies, right? So we, were, we, got, we see owners of companies. And I was calling on these two brothers in Tennessee they want a packaging company. They make the boxes that you, uh, when uh, you get goods and services from, think Amazon, the box, they make the boxes. Um, so I'm talking to these two brothers. They're a third generation company. I ask them about their employees. How's your turnover? Um, is it hard to find people that are skilled, et cetera? And, they, and I told them what we're doing for our people. And he's, I remember the brother said two things to me. One is, most of our people have worked here for two and three generations. They're family to us. They're, they're, the quality of their life is important to us. And then when they heard a story about what we're doing for our teammates, they said, I got to have that. Can I get that? I need that. I want to give that to my people. And so we, we, we're like, whoa, 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 we're not ready for that yet. And I went back and I had three or four clients uh, right out of the box because I only told a few of them about it. And they all had the same reactions. I got to have that for my people. My people, you know, they're, they don't know how to manage money. They, don't, they need help with navigating the complexities of this landscape. So we now have 90, client, 90 companies, multiplied by the number of people working in those companies, signed up doing this stuff. And we ask the companies to make a pledge to make a contribution to the checking account, just like we did. And it can range from 100 bucks to 1,000. I say it should be on the 1,000 end. But it averages out about 470 bucks per person that We've got 90 companies um, signed up and 75 complete, 76, that are actually doing that for their people, which is pretty cool. So we think we, um, so, our, so our marketing head, Susan, she started a movement. We've got on, we got on up um, at 3 million people in America have signed up uh, on up.com and begun that journey. So pretty cool. We're trying, to, we're trying to help out where we can. So I better move on up then, right? So. Hey, get, I, you gotta get on there, I'm on up.com, save yourself from yourself. Exactly. I'm going to move to the final set of questions before we open it to you to ask questions. Um, I, I want to know what advice do you have for our students, maybe who, who are interested or thinking about financial services as a career, um, just in general, what advice do you have for them? Well, look, if, if I, I have to start with a confession. I had no intention of being a banker when I was sitting in, the, in, in your chair right now. I, mean, I had none. I didn't want to be a banker. Um, didn't know what a banker was. Didn't know what a banker did. Um, seemed kind of boring to me. And, and I was uneducated. So I didn't go into banking. I went into the automobile industry because I think cars are cool. And that's where I wanted to be. But it turns out I went to work at Ford Motor Company. And it turns out what was cool wasn't what I was doing. What was cool is designing a car or engineering a car or maybe even manufacturing a car, but not representing somebody else's body of work in this, in this cool three-dimensional kinetic structure and escorting it to a dealership. I go, ah, 
That's, I, I feel like, I don't really feel like I'm adding any value. I don't really feel like I'm making a difference. This feels bad. And so I decided to go to grad school. Um, and then in grad school, I discovered this banking thing. And I go, whoa, what is this all about? And it turns out the difference is in banking, you are the product, not the car. Because when you show up in front of a client, it's your intellectual capital that is the product. It's what you, can you think through, do you know what data you have to learn, the facts on the ground you need to learn so that you can figure out where this client wants to go and how to, what, how to help them get there? And, if, and suddenly you're the product, it's super cool and I liked it because I, I felt like I was making a difference. And when, you, when you're helping a company, when we have a company that's a consumer goods company that sold their, uh, the patriarch died, the kids inherited it, it we, helped, we went to them and said, how can we help you? Um, we gave them a range of options from do nothing to buy, you know, bolt on some other products to sell your company. They said, how much is the company worth? Um, we said, we did the math. Uh, their eyes got really big because it was hundreds of millions of dollars, um, more than $100 million per kid. That was good. And they said, uh, we'd like to go about selling it. And we found the buyer. We financed the buyer who had already run a company like that before and sold it. And now we have those assets in the, our ba private bank. We're helping that family run their money. We're helping the new owner grow the company. And it's all, it's all beautiful. So you're in the center of the big top with cool stuff. And I, who knew? I didn't know that. Maybe, maybe I should have taken more finance classes when I was here. I don't know. There's still time, right? Yeah, I'm still learning. He's going to come back and teach for us. He's already told me that as we were walking down the but hall. But I have to learn something before I can uh, teach. We've got a spot for you. My last question for Bo, for, uh, for, for him to answer for you, and then we'll open it up, is um, as you've, you know, sort of climbed the corporate ladder, you've certainly seen uh, more complex organizations. You've seen the importance of uh, certainly some of the tenets and pillars that we talk about here, ethical decision making and yeah. uh, team-based decisions and uh, diverse teams. How do, you, how do you manage that? You've moved through these big organizations. How do you ensure that you're, as you rise up that, that your finger's on the tip of all this and you yeah. ensure that those things are being handled? Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot in that, so we unpack it a little bit. Um, you know, ethics means doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. I think. I mean, it's not really that complex. And so when we say we're client first, that's that. That's like, hey, I, I don't care about anything else. Let's do the right thing for the client and deliver on that. And we'll sort everything else out um, on the inside of the company. But we got to do what we got to do because our clients are counting on us. And they'll remain our clients if we do that. So that, that's sort of the ethics piece. Um, it gets difficult, though, when your competitors don't do it that way. And I'll give you a concrete example. When we're helping a client finance, um, do a syndicated loan deal, and there's a lot of structuring that goes into it, and we're saying, here's the best way for you to do that. And here are the different constraints we would put in place on that, and here's the, here's the price you should pay, and here's our strategy for going to market that we think will get you the best deal. And, um, and let's say, we, and we think that the market clearing price is gonna be X. And our competitor comes in and says, no, it's going to be Y, and you don't need to do all those bells and whistles that those guys told you to. And we're right, but the deal that the other bank put on the table looks more attractive. They wish for it to be the deal, but we know that what they're really trying to do is, is seduce them with the, an illusory, shiny object to get hired to do it, and then ultimately end up with our deal but said, well, we really tried to do it this way, but the market wouldn't let us. And we're like, no, we, we want to tell the client straight up. This is where it's going to go. And they're telling you a story. And if you like a story, that's great. But we're not going to tell you a story. And if you want to hire them, that's fine. But we're going to tell it straight. And that's how we roll. And it turns out that um, one of our very first clients in Cincinnati, actually our first client, had a problem with another bank. And... Um, they completely butchered a syndicate loan deal, and we've been hired on Ben's team to, um, to fix that problem created by the other bank because they actually weren't expert enough in syndicate loan markets, and they got it wrong. And so guess what? We now have a very loyal client for life because we did that. You had one chance to make it right, yeah. 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 Well, first. thank you for answering my questions. I want to open it up to our audience. Does anyone want to ask Bo a specific question, general question, thoughts on your mind? 
We have a guy. I'll try to repeat your question so everybody can hear it. So go ahead. Or you can use the mic if you'd like. Uh, you talked about disrupting the middle market banking space with bringing you know, like a full set of options that a larger bank would have to smaller clients so that they still get the same amount of care but with more options available to them. Do you foresee maybe in the very long run SunTrust also trying to disrupt other areas of financial services like you know, uh, insurance or asset management? Yeah, so uh, the, you guys heard the question. So yeah, we, um, disruption is sort of the ultimate form of competitive advantage. And, and so every one of our business um, owners, line, we have multiple lines of business, we have a process where they have to come in and they have to declare what the competitive advantage is, which decoded is to say, all right, so a, a client is going to deal with SunTrust bankers and bankers from all these other banks, why should they hire SunTrust? What's, what's the advantage to the client? What, do you, what makes you better? And a lot of times they come up with these fancy long paragraphs that are you know, you know, sparkly and nice, but they don't have any content. And we're like, that's BS, I don't buy it. It's not good, you gotta go back. If you're not good enough, I mean, if your leader of your business tells you they don't have an advantage, you probably need a new leader. So they are, um, so we put a little performance tension in the system to, to encourage people to do that. And then disruption is, is part vision, and not everybody's got a vision, frankly. But some people can just be more efficient. They can, um, you know, this one team thing isn't, it's, it's maybe a little bit visionary, but it's not really complex. Um, how you engineer it's complex. But uh, yeah, so, yeah, we're gonna, our objective would be disrupt any place we can um, but, you know, enlightenment doesn't come to every leader in every line of business on the same day, so I wouldn't expect them to all be sort of, you know, parallel pathing, if that makes any sense. Who has the if next you, question? If you have any great vision, we'd need to talk. Next question. Our questions were so good. So good. Right. We Come on. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little career advice for you. When you have an opportunity to assert, asserting, beha assertive behavior is a winning behavior, um, passive behavior is a losing behavior, I would recommend asserting. Let's try again. I'm going to ask one while you think about one, because I had so many that I wanted to ask, but I wanted to save you time. It is baseball season. Yeah. And you guys are in sort of a partnership with the Braves, my home team from the south where I grew up. So how did you guys make that decision? Well, with SunTrust Park up. Yeah, so SunTrust Park, if you come to Atlanta, um, you got to go to SunTrust Park. It's actually the coolest stadium in Major League Baseball. And um, it sounds like, you know, I would say that, but the fact of the matter is every other um, Major League Baseball team's owners have come through Atlanta to see it, to understand. And what's unique about it is it isn't just a stadium. It's actually an entire town. And uh, we, we have the, the naming rights and we partnered with the folks who built the town. We financed it. We financed the stadium. We, we partnered with the Braves. Liberty Media owns the Braves. And so we're, so we're in this together. But why is the question. And the answer is because we are a regional bank with, a cert, with the disadvantages and advantages of scale. Meaning, you know, we're, we're competing with banks 10 times our size who have marketing budgets 10 times our size and there's scalability to marketing and advertising and social media dollars. And we had to ha find an innovative um, way to be known without um, trying to spend the same money they do. So SunTrust Park, by the way, puts us in every, every place the Braves go, uh, and, and wherever, whatever team we play, they're on TV. You might notice if you watch a, a Braves game or if you watch a Reds game when they're playing the Braves, You'll see our signage is unbelievable, and when our team in LA report, yeah, we don't. Have to t we never have to tell anybody who's SunTrust Bank. They don't ask. San Francisco, they don't ask. Everybody knows because of this. So it's really, um, it's already, it's already accomplishing the mission. It's pretty exciting, and, and it's a world class venue for uh, entertaining our clients. So every game we have, a, we have a, a suite there, and it's a sweet suite, if you will, and uh, and we take our clients there, and it's really, and they love it. We have the seats right in front of home plate. 
Uh, we got multiple sections of seats like that. So um, it's, a, it's an experience unlike any other. And at any time we turn on the TV to watch a Braves game, I get to see who's sitting in the seats. So I get to see who's working tonight, taking clients to the baseball game. So that's really nice. We'll keep that in mind. I uh, have one last question, but I'll give it to you if you would like it. Well, we, got a, we got a man sitting over there. Let's hear it. Can you speak loudly until I get there with the mic? I'll get there really fast, I promise. Yeah, you want the mic. So on the diagram in the beginning, you said that you guys were between the bulge and the middle bracket. Yep. What other uh, banks occupy the same space as you guys, or are there any? Well, the, so I, I painted it as a, as a binary equation. You're in or you're out. Uh, with, um, there's a, a little more of a continuum there. So w one of the banks that um, is running the same play, if you will, is KeyCorp. Um, I don't, you know, the, by the way, it's a, it's a friend of mine and ours who uh, built that. Also a fraternity brother, if we have to go there. And so, you know, we got a little banking in the blood here and this, it's pretty well run. It's a pretty good, um, it's a good version of that. But I know, because we've hired some bankers from KeyCorp, that they have whiteboarded our entire thing and they're trying to emulate us um, and trying to run, because we're actually more effective at it. Uh, and all the numbers would say that. So they look at that going, um, I would put us at the leader in the pack, but they're doing it. Um, other companies that are trying to do, I mean, PNC is run by a guy who is an investment banker by background, Bill Demchek. He's, and he, so he understands this plane and would like to run it. He's, they've got a capital markets unit, but they haven't really wired it the same way in my opinion. Um, U.S. Bank has tried to do the same thing, and I know the people that are doing it over there. Um, and you know, they tend to they they tend to be more focused on the investment grade space, which is way up market, and not down in the leverage finance space, which is where the the private companies live. So there are per variations of permutations across the landscape of trying to run this. And you know, five years from now, everybody will be running it. I would submit to you, it's just it's really hard to do. Um, history tells you that. You could look at U.S. Bank used to own Piper Jaffray. Um, they don't own Piper Jaffray anymore because it had, in my vernacular, organ rejection. Um, investment bankers and commercial bankers slash retail bankers often don't coexist very well, um, especially when it's the commercial and, and retail bankers are in charge. Um, it, it causes problems. So that happened there. And, um, you know, Fifth Third locally is trying to, is running a, a version of this, but they don't have all the capabilities. And it's very hard, if you think about the core tenant of the strategy, is to have investment banking capabilities that are co fully competitive with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan resident at your company. Well, it's pretty hard to get all those folks to move to Cincinnati, Ohio, frankly. Um, it's pretty hard to get them all to move to Cleveland, um, although they've done a pretty good job. But if you look at where they have their teams, they're distributed. U.S. Bank has People in New York and Chicago and Charlotte, they patchworked it together to try to build the, the team. Um, we've actually took advantage of a little bit of luck, and luck matters a lot in careers, and you know, it matters a lot in strategy. But the luck was, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, back in um, 1990 or so, a couple of banks there decided um, to take on Wall Street and build these in a regional bank, build investment banking platforms. It was Nations Bank, it was First Union, uh, subsequently Wells, uh, Wachovia, and they, they brought in hundreds and hundreds of people from New York and plotted them in to Charlotte where uh, I was among that wave of people and they, and the people came down like, you gotta be kidding me, my compensation doubled and my housing prices got cut in half. This is beautiful. Uh, and so the standard of living skyrocketed. So it was a great trade for the people. And then what happened later is, fast forward 20 years later, is those turned into Bank of America and Wells Fargo. And then those guys all said, hey, what are we, what are we doing in Charlotte? That's ridiculous. We're reconstituting ourselves in New York, which led, left a installed base of highly trained, highly tenured talent sitting in Charlotte going, hey, what happened? Where'd the game go? And that was going to last for only a short period of time before they all found something else to do. And so that's why I kind of hatched the scheme of, let's do this in Atlanta. It's in the Southeast. 
we could probably get a whole bunch of those folks to move from Charlotte to Atlanta. And we kind of had a, maybe an 80% yield. But then I go, well, let's open up a trading floor in an office in Charlotte, and we'll pick up the rest of them. And we did. And so we were like, boom, first mover advantage. And we had, um, we had something that's difficult to repeat, which is an installed base of talent, hundreds of people that we could lift out who we don't need to train who are expert. So I hope that answers your question. Well, Blue, as a native of North Carolina, I thank you for helping my state, and I thank you for coming back to Miami. Let's all join me in thanking Bo for being here. Thank you, too. And always, Bo, you're, you're welcome home. Thank you so much.